God who is with us when we feel amiss. God who loves us in every moment. Please speak through these words that we may have life abundant. Thank you for your grace. Amen. So I had my first stress dream about a sermon for this sermon. I've only had one other stress dream in my life, and it was right before a swim meet when I was 13. I don't like things blocking me. Okay. Um, in that dream, I was a little child at a funeral, and I didn't know who the funeral was for. So I went up to the casket, and I peeked inside, and there was 13-year-old me floating in pool water in her swimming suit and her goggles. <laughs> so the stress dream for this sermon was a little less dramatic, but I just needed you to know how I was feeling. <laughs> I always like to take on bite-sized, doable sermon topics. This morning, it's making the leap into your dream, living into your purpose. I was planning to have it all figured out by Sunday, August 6th at 11 a.m. We'll see how it goes. Our scripture for today is even more bite-sized and doable. The gospel according to Thomas reads, Jesus said, if you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. So according to this passage, you have two options. Give birth to what is within you or die. Is that what you're interpreting too? Let's keep thinking about this. So as you may have guessed, uh, this passage also comes from an extra canonical text. Uh, which means it was used as sacred scripture by early Christians, but not included in the final version of the Bible. The final version of the Bible was decided upon by bishops and councils in the 4th and 6th centuries, 4th through 6th. No decisions were made about what would be included or excluded from the Bible until 300 years after Jesus' life. And so... My using of these extra canonical texts is an act of taking the Jesus movement seriously. It's not about making the included texts of the Bible any less important, but it is about learning and gleaning wisdom from the full scope of our Christian tradition. Unlike some of the other Gospels, the Gospel of Thomas uh, seems to have been written in the very same cent century that Jesus lived and died and was widely used in the ancient world. If you bring forth what is within you, what you bring forth will save you. If you do not bring forth what is within you, what you do not bring forth will destroy you. Another translation reads, when you give birth to the one within you, that one will save you. If you do not, that one will kill you. This is easy to understand in a physical sense. I have never been pregnant. But I would imagine that indeed, when you are pregnant with a child, especially in the ancient world, you need to give birth to the child. If you cannot, you could lose your life. This makes sense. But what does this mean in a metaphorical sense? This kind of sounds like a threat, Jesus. There currently exists a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States alone, $11 billion to be exact, dedicated to teaching us how to improve ourselves and live our dreams. It sells us the steps to take so we can live our best lives, achieve personal transformation, and finally create a business and life we love. Sometimes through thoughts, through words, through webinars, sometimes through incense and smoke and mantras and positivity cards, through our language, through investing lots of time and money into learning from these people who are going to help us discover our purpose. These self-improvement gurus seem to have all the answers we've been looking for. You can find several motivational speeches on YouTube with titles like Your Belief 
yeah, your beliefs create your reality, overcome your negative emotions, and programming your mind for success. I'm not bringing this up to argue that personal development is evil or bad. If that were my argument, I'd have to confess to sometimes watching that stuff. I confess. <laughs> uh, Marie Forleo, specifically. Um, we ought to critique the self-help industry because we need to change the world rather than just striving to succeed within it as is. But we also need to examine the longing that it speaks to. Because what this phenomenon does, have, does also make abundantly clear is that people are struggling to live into their dreams. People are struggling to live lives that they love, to feel like they are pursuing a sense of purpose and significance. And something about these self-improvement gurus is striking a chord with masses of people, fulfilling a need that the church largely has failed to speak to, especially the liberal church an emptiness, a longing for meaning, purpose, and a sense of achievement. And that struggle is real. I'll speak for my own millennial generation. We are deeply disillusioned with existing institutions and their ability to provide us with long-term financial stability, hello student loans, <laughs> let alone meaning and fulfillment. So I'm going to jump around a lot in this sermon. Welcome to my mind. Um, <laughs> But I, yeah, but I have to interject here and say that um, part of why I struggled with the sermon is because I forgot my origin until like this morning. I forgot what I initially set out to do, what I felt in a place to be able to do. My first sermon was actually titled Aimlessness. I wanted to explore the experience of feeling stuck in an extended wilderness of trying to move through a slog but not feeling clear about where to go or how to begin, I wanted to talk about asadia, which is a form of spiritual despair that resembles depression. I wanted to talk about depression and not just hormonal imbalance in the brain but as a public feeling, a rational response to our present insane condition. So how did I end up with the sermon topic, Making the Leap? And this is how you're going to pursue your purpose. Because I'm impatient. Because I wanted to skip over the wilderness. Because I myself am deeply afraid of the hard process of birthing a dream. Of the pain and mess of it. Of the toddler years where you have to guide and encourage the little dream. Of the leadership and authority it would demand of me of the giving up of my life for a dream that's mine to birth. The Thomas passage was a response to that. I think it was an experiment for me to see if dry bones would come alive with a direct enough command from Jesus. But even Jesus was always big on giving the demon a name first. My name is Legion, for we are many. It was only then that Jesus could cast the demon into the sea. Because if we properly, if we fail to properly name the demon, we end up speaking words without meaning. So today may be a mixture of nonsense and meaning. And I don't put it past God to work through me anyway. But I'll name two demons that are my testimony on the topic of making the leap after this sermon. One demon, not asking for help second demon, comparing myself to others, I will never preach like Martin Luther King Jr. I cannot be Bishop Yvette Flunder. I can only be myself. The struggle is real. Let's go ahead and name some more demons. Please say amen if I have a witness. Um, I need this to not just be about what I'm doing today. I really need to hear from you. Thank you. So thinking that uh, things that make purpose challenging include but are not limited to busyness, constant distraction, never having a quiet moment alone, having to pay the bills and so doing things that pay the bills but aren't your dream, anxiety, the overwhelming and paralyzing feeling that you have nothing to offer, 
Depression, unresolved trauma, debilitating grief, feeling so far away from a past self which you now idealize as the time when I had my magic, which you have somehow now permanently lost your magic. <laughs> Netflix, Instagram, Facebook, letting email and text messages run your life saying yes to every person who wants to hang out, saying no to every person that gets too close because you've been hurt before or intimacy freaks you out, not really feeling clear about your purpose or hearing a clear call from God and hoping you'll get something else, <laughs> feeling, feeling like you were once clear, but now it's not what you thought it was going to be, having to take care of others, choosing to take care of others, not taking care of yourself, Continually telling yourself bad things about yourself, like, I can't, I can't, I can't. Actually, turn to your neighbor right now and say, be nicer to yourself. <laughs> Thank you, because this was literally me at 3 o'clock in the morning in the bed going, I can, I can, I can, and I tried. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So at this point, you probably think today's sermon is about you. <laughs> As in about what you have to do to finally live into your purpose. About the importance of the gifts you've been given and how it's up to you to achieve them before you die because if you don't, never having fulfilled your dreams will lead to your spiritual, if not physical, death. And full disclosure, I kind of wanted this sermon to be about me too. I wanted to just find the solution, crack the code on making the leap into my purpose with the help of God and a very definite, inflexible deadline. So Joel and I were in Los Angeles for a wedding last week. I never warned him. It was my first time in LA and it was beautiful. On our last day, Joel and I were walking through Santa Barbara the sun was just beginning to set. The palm trees were slowly swaying in the breeze. The sound of the ocean could be heard off in the distance. The air was just beginning to cool down. And Joel made a casual remark. He said, <laughs> he said, man, I could see myself living here. And it hit a trigger. And suddenly, I wasn't so into the trees, slowly swaying in the breeze anymore. <laughs> you want to live here? Joel, have you been listening to me talk about my deepest desires? I feel called to live in the Bronx. <laughs> Didn't you know this before you married me? It's the work I feel called by the Lord to do. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, we went back and forth, um, each trying to be nice and watch our tone. <laughs> He's saying he just wants to feel free to express his feelings in the present moment, and he doesn't actually want to move here. And I'm saying I just want him to understand the way a comment like that makes me feel. <laughs> and finally he says, well, I have put a lot of work into our transition into the Bronx, and I would appreciate if you would acknowledge that. And then I said, thank you. <laughs> and then <laughs> we stopped talking. And walked down the sidewalk past all the happy people with the breeze softly blowing, the sun softly kissing our shoulders, not holding hands, just walking forward, straight ahead. For the first five minutes, I was saying things in my head like, ugh, does he want a trophy? <laughs> Why isn't he listening to me? If he was really listening, if he really knew me, he would know that that comment would make me feel a certain way. And then after another 10 minutes, I got tired. I just started spacing out. You know, being righteous is very exhausting. <laughs> so, 
very tiring. So in another five minutes, I just reached toward his hand because I realized I wasn't mad about anything. Um, and then we got ice cream, uh, and then we ate the ice cream and talked about life on a bench. So the point of all this is, it's not always about what you do. Sometimes the word is to stop doing. Like, just stop talking. Stop typing. Take five, take 15. That's when your inner wisdom can come through. That's when God can speak. The second point is, everything doesn't have to be an obstacle. Some things are legitimate obstacles. A lot of things are not. A lot of things we can just let go of. Not everything is a big deal. Sometimes you just have to stop giving things energy and then watch them fade away. Part of the problem is we think it's all about what we're doing. Are we listening for the voice of God? I can tell you how this has looked for me. This is sort of my ideal story that I try to get back to. Um, so when I started feeling a sense of calling from God to ministry, I didn't know exactly what it meant. Um, it was things like I was sitting in my room and suddenly the air would just get really still. And I just had a sense that it was, it was like I just had this knowing that it was God. And that it had something to do with this church that my dad had been talking about starting. Um, and then it was um, like sometimes I would get woken up at like 3 a.m. I think there's something about 3 a.m. It's like a magic hour. And I just knew that, that God was trying to tell me something. So I would get up. And I would get out my journal, and I would write, and I would try to figure out what it was. I think it's, it's a lot easier to be attuned to God in the beginning of things, when we're first making the leap. When I first started feeling called to ministry and to New Day specifically, I was intentionally listening for God. I was expecting the presence of God. But as the years have passed, I've easily fallen into thinking this is my own journey, and it's all up to me. When that happens, what often easily follows is shame. I'm not doing enough. I'm failing. It will never measure up to what it could be. My commitment hasn't changed, but my ears have. There's so many passages in the Bible about listening for God or failing to listen. Let anyone with ears to hear listen, Mark. Let anyone with ears listen, Matthew. Ears to hear and eyes to see, both are gifts from God. Proverbs. Then Jesus said, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. It's a major issue. Are we listening? Miss King, who was an active member of our previous church in Brooklyn, often sends me encouraging memes and songs on Facebook. And I have to confess that I don't pay much attention to them. I figure she probably sends them to everyone. She messaged me again yesterday, and when I first saw it, I didn't think to open it. But then later on, as I was reflecting on the quality of my own listening for God, I thought, maybe I should open it. It was a recording of my help, which is kind of what I was trying to write about. <laughs> says, I will lift up mine eyes to the hills, from whence cometh my help. My help cometh from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. When I scrolled, I couldn't find that I had ever responded to her. But still, she regularly sent me messages with things like, your future is secure in God's hands. And yield to the Lord and let him work. And faith is about trusting God even when you don't understand. Dad sent me a text yesterday that said, I'm praying for you, Lisa, that you receive and share a healing, loving, and compassionate word. May you experience the living presence of God working with you and through you. Are we listening? It's not all about what we do. Now, I know I told you this sermon wasn't about you. 
But we do worship a God of paradox, of spirit made flesh, of fully human and fully divine. And so today I leave you with this paradox. It's not all about what you do. Sometimes the word is to stop doing. But at the same time, God can't do it without you. Let me phrase it another way. It's not all up to us. And at the same time, it's absolutely up to us. Dreaming is important. Talking about your dream and posting about it on Facebook and getting people excited about your dream is great. Ask me how I know. Not acting. <laughs> I don't want to. Not acting on your dreams is a recipe for denial, numbness, and resentment. Ask me how I know. Don't really ask me. Don't really ask me. <laughs> it's a recipe for living a life in the audience as a spectator, never really engaging life, only watching from the sidelines. Langston Hughes wrote a poem called The Dream Keeper. It says, bring me all your dreams, you dreamers. Bring me all your heart melodies, that I may wrap them in a blue cloud cloth, away from the two rough fingers of the world. Away, I want to save my dream. Away from the two rough fingers of the world. David Morgan um, said something to me recently on this topic that has stuck with me. He said, dreaming is like worship, but then comes the wilderness of doing. Worship is important because we are reconnected to God, to ourselves, to our dreams and emotions and visions. And then comes the wilderness of doing. And God did not create us to be puppets with God as the puppet master. Bishop Flunder remarks that one of the reasons some people feel like they don't have anything to do is because they're in conflict with God about what they're called to do. It's not that God isn't speaking. It's that we don't like what we're hearing. <laughs> so we send God back saying, go and think of something else. I'm not appreciating what you said. I don't want to do that with them. But God will not coerce you into living out what you've been called to do. I'm sorry. God will try to keep telling you, ask me how I know. <laughs> if you do not obey, eventually you will die, and someone else will take on that dream. Turn to your neighbor and say, you will die. There was, I'm just going to leave it there. <laughs> there. There was recently an article in the Harvard Business Review where the author posed the question, why do so few people find fulfillment in their work? Researchers responded, students think their calling is under a rock. And if they turn over enough rocks, they will find it. Can I get a witness? Our passage for today says that the thing you're called to do, the thing you're called to give birth to, is already inside you. We often imagine calling as coming from the outside in, or salvation coming from the outside in. But today's passage is about bringing forth, about birthing, that which is already within you. So you don't have to go looking for it. It wakes up with you. It goes to bed with you. And bringing it forth into the world, wounds, gifts, life experiences, and all, I'm not just talking about bringing forth the pretty stuff, is key to your salvation. My track coach in high school used to tell our team, no excuses, just results. She also used to say, I don't care if you're crawling over the finish line. You always have more than you think. And while I haven't always followed this advice, it has stuck with me. At some point, our lives in this body will end. And in the end, we will either have the fruits of our labors 
or we will have a lot of empty promises and reasons why we couldn't. It's not all about what you do, and God can't do it without you. Listen for the ways God calls you. Try expecting that God is speaking to you. Choose to wake up when God wants to deliver you a message at 3 in the morning. Trust the moment when you're alone in your room and the air turns still. And you're given an inner knowing that this visitation has something to do with God's will for your life. Be truly available. Do what your heart is telling you to do. What you're looking for resides inside you. God will find you there. Amen.